Hello everyone, my name is Fox. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at the GPT Win Mini where we're going to be applying some PTM 7950. This is going to be kind of specific to the GPT Win Mini, so we're going to have like a full-on disassembly video so it can show you how you can do it. So it's a how-to guide on how to change the thermal interface material on a GPT Win Mini by itself, not necessarily with PTM 7950. However, PTM 7950 as a thermal pad is the stuff that I am pretty much only going to recommend to people uh, for a number of reasons. Number one, the thermal properties of it are absolutely excellent. Number two, it is exceedingly forgiving, even if you mess up on the application. Now, I actually did a pretty good job. This is my third time applying 7950. You can see like right over here, I've chopped it up a bunch. So I've applied it onto my GB1 Max 2, which is what I'm using right now. I've applied it onto a GB1 4, and now I've applied it onto a GB1 Mini. This is the stuff that I love to use. Uh, and there's a specific place that you should be buying this from. So I'm going to be linking that in the description field below because there are some other providers of PTM 7950 that might not be authentic. And this has been going around. Obviously, the Reddit thread of talking about this has talked about it in great detail. So I'll just link the one that I know to be a valid source to where you can get it. That's not an affiliate link. That's just so you can wear, know where you can get it. But this video's purpose is twofold. Number one, to serve as a disassembly video and a how-to guide for people that want to know how to apply thermal paste, as well as moving around different parts of the device itself. And number two, the benefits of going to PTM 7950 as a general rule, especially when there's an open die that's available to you and you're not going to have to use that much to put on the device itself. And you can use specifically exactly what you need. And the thermal conductivity of the material itself isn't something that you have to worry about like you would have to with liquid metal while still getting very liquid metal like results. So with that out of the way, let's go on to the disassembly and how to application on this video and follow up with the graphs. All right, so in this video, we're gonna use PTM 7950. This is the good stuff. So it is a bit expensive and you don't get a bunch of it, but you can see that I've already chopped up a bunch of different pieces of here and I already applied it to my GPT-Win Max 2 and the GPT-Win 4. It is actually fantastic stuff. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna remove the back plate here and there are a bunch of screws. Let's count, we have one, two, three, four, five, and then three on the back six seven eight so eight screws in total we also have these two little screws which may just be a part of the switch that's probably not going to affect the back case so let's start removing some of these screws and see what's going on all right so we got all those screws out now all of them are still kind of in there they didn't pop out so you can see that they're still there uh, this back plate the bottom plate just comes right off there's no no real actual um like clips that are holding in the bottom plate however we do have this which is right there what does this connect to and what is its purpose oh these are for the rumble motors okay so let us all right so that's easy enough to disconnect the the cable connects right there so you just want to pull it down and those are for the rumble motors that happen on the bottom which actually do feel quite nice so at this point we can go ahead and start removing the heatsink fan solution so we can get to the die and we can clean it all up and then apply the ptm 7950 and then we'll be in a much better place all right so let's take a few moments to consider what's going on here so here is the heatsink for the 2230 drive itself and you can see that there's a screw that's holding part of that down so the chip is right here we have a heat pipe that's going this way so we have to remove that screw this screw first we're going to take off the fan itself so let's start there here is the connector for the fan itself and there should be three screws one two three and that's it for the fan itself so let's get to that all right so i've went ahead and removed those three screws so now we can start to remove the fan we will have to remove this power cable so we'll get into that in just a second you shouldn't use anything that's metal there because you might actually rip out the cable itself so anything that's metal get rid of and there's some tape here which is going to be holding down the fan as, as well so we're going to pull up on there and start like basically just disengaging it from the tape itself. So this tape acts as a sort of baffle so that all of the fan is not is directed, right? We want it to go over these fins, these copper fins where the heat pipe is. We don't want the fan spilling over. So this is just to direct the airflow over there. And you can leave this connected if you want to, if you just want to have it on the side. Uh, it's not really that difficult to remove and replace. So I'm gonna go ahead and remove it myself. But if you wanted to like leave that in, you totally could just so you can see that it is, if I can get this in focus. Okay, it's a red cable on the left side. So red cable that way is the way it goes in so that you can know and try to keep your 
screws and fan together. At this point, we can start removing the screws that are holding in the heatsink. So the die is right here, and we have the heat pipe, and we have to remove this part as well. So we're going to be lifting this up off of the SSD and because we have to get to it because this part is attached to it. So let's start removing that. I just want to highlight this. I haven't started removing anything yet, but we actually have an additional screw that is going through and barreled down over here, and that is also holding that down. So we actually have to remove this component as well, which is the micro SD card slot and what looks to maybe be the Oculink port, but the Oculink port might be mounted onto the motherboard itself. So this is likely to just be the micro SD card uh, controller. So let's go ahead and remove that. All right, so this part has been removed. Now I put these screws on the side and I've been personally keeping track. So I have my fan screws here. These are the back screws for my uh, Win Mini. So I'm gonna go ahead and gonna just move that over here. And then I have another three screws over here, which are for here. And I've also aligned them in the direction that they need to be. We can see that this is the micro SD as well as a three and a half millimeter audio jack connected to this little uh, cable right here. This can pop right off if you don't wanna keep it around. This is something that'll kind of just push back in. So we're gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and just remove it. Okay, so that pops right out. It's like this little, nice little socket that you can just push in. So that's gonna push back in and it'll have a nice satisfying click when you put it back together. I'm gonna go ahead and put this part over here. At this point, we're getting closer and closer to just getting to the part where it's here. This looks like it's gonna be another screw that we're gonna need a flathead to remove that. I'm also going to remove this heat sink block for the heat, uh, the 2230. And this might actually be holding down the, 20, the 2230 as well. So let me go ahead and remove that and see what's up. I can actually remove this while I'm recording uh, and doing it through the viewfinder. I had to do the other ones not through the viewfinder just because it's kind of a pain to unscrew things through a viewfinder. Like looking at it, yeah, look at that. The SSD comes up all together with it. So I am going to remove this. So we're gonna just kind of like wiggle. Oh, the entire thing is coming out. Like um, the heatsink is coming right off. All right, so there is the heatsink itself with a little bit of thermal tape. And then here we have the, I don't know why it wasn't coming out before. So this is a 20, uh, 2230 drive. And at this point, we removed everything that was kind of blocking our way here. I'm going to go ahead and remove this one first. I'll have to switch my, my flathead to a flathead. And we have one, two, one, two, three, and then four. There's four screws holding this down. We'll be able to take this off, and that'll include this heat pipe with the fins that are over here. So let's go ahead and remove those. So just so you guys can see it, I've been using a uh, Phillips head for everything else during this entire project. I literally could use the same one for all of them, but I'm going to go ahead and use a flathead. There we go. And this is now removed. At this point, it can be hand loosened because we don't want to lose this one. This one is like pretty critical. Okay, we're going to put that out over on the side. Now, I still have all of these screws that are still in here but they should be removed by this point. So I can now, yeah, it comes right off. All right, and that part comes right out. And I shouldn't have lifted it like that because all the screws just came jumping out. I caught two in my hand. And do I have another one? Wow, how lucky was that? That was crazy lucky. You just saw a bunch of luck right there. So now we're going to get some isopropyl alcohol. We're going to clean up this pad, make sure that it's super nice and clean and do the same for right here. So I'll go ahead and do that now. All right. So we have my isopropyl alcohol. I have two Q-tips. This is basically for the final parts of this. And then I got two paper towels, uh, just like two sheets. So I'll go ahead and get rid of one, put this on the side. We'll very quickly go ahead and clean up the heatsink itself. So let's go ahead and do that. So I'm gonna get some isopropyl alcohol. Now the reason why you wanna use isopropyl alcohol is because uh, isopropyl alcohol, especially the higher percentage, it will eva it'll evaporate. So it's not going to remain liquid. So even if you have like a thin layer, it should just dissipate into the air. So we're gonna go ahead and clean that off, okay? 
Now you want to make sure that you kind of really get in there because if there's like any dirt or residue on it, that's going to impede the flow of heat into the copper itself, which will then impede it to the heat pipe, so on and so forth. You basically want to just keep on cleaning until you don't see anything. And there's going to be some grain, a grain pattern that you're going to try to see on there. Because typically what you want to do, the best type of heat sink will be ones that are like mirror lapped. And that's, you know, a pretty extreme process. Okay, so we can still see so a little bit there. I'll go ahead and clean that up once more. But you kind of want to do circular motions, straight motions, left and right, just in case that there's something left in the grain. And this is why you want it to be as clean as possible. With the PTM 7950, it'll fill in those gaps. That's what thermal grease actually does. It fills in the gaps between them so that there is no air. Air is an inhibitor. It's going to insulate heat. Uh, it's going to be something that will stay, keep heat on the process itself, which is something we don't want. So I'm going to go ahead and reuse this. Kind of just generally wipe the area that needs to get done. I'm going to physically look at this so that I'm going to bring it back to you and it'll be done. All right, so I've gone ahead and cleaned that off, and you can see that there. But you can see all the dust particles are on, that are on there. You're going to want to make sure that that is as clean as you possibly can get it before we start trying to layer on the PTM-75. But I've only just used the, the paper towel dry to remove the top part here. So I haven't even gone ahead and used any isopropyl alcohol, so I'm going to go ahead and do that now. Just so you can see how I'm doing with the Q-tip, just so you can get an idea. Now, you can do this a bunch of different ways. You can remove the cap and just kind of let the uh, solution kind of pool up down here. So you're going to go down here, okay? And that's how you can get it wet without having to make a mess of anything. That's one way to do it. You could also, if it has like a little applicator on there, you can also do that as well. But now that we have isopropyl alcohol on the Q-tip itself, okay, as it goes to this side, okay? Now we can go ahead and clean the actual dye itself, make sure that there's nothing on there. And then at that point, we're going to start trying to apply the uh, PTM7950, and we'll go from there. And just so you can see, even though it looked clean, we're getting around as much as we can. But take a look at the what the isopropyl alcohol cleaned up on that Q-tip. This is going to make sure that there's nothing left over on that dye, so that we just have a really clean contact with the PTM7950 from the dye itself through the PTM7950 directly to the dye of the heatsink itself. It's very important that there isn't any leftover residue, no oils from your fingers. You shouldn't be touching this area. You should try to keep this dust-free and grease-free and dirt-free as possible. It needs to be very, very clean. At that point, you can go ahead and start using the clean layer. Look, you can see the, how the alcohol evaporates. That's why you want to use the alcohol, because it's going to self-evaporate and make sure that, you know, after you power on the device, that the alcohol should have dried up, so it won't be bridging any contacts and causing any shorts for you. And that's why we use isopropyl alcohol. And just so you can see, it seems like it should already be relatively clean, but we're going to go ahead and really get into it with the Q-tip again. And you want to go at it from every angle possible. Okay, we want to go at it this way. You can see that there's still stuff that's getting picked up. We want to go at it from this way. Basically, wherever there's going to be a grain, you want to make sure you get it. All right, so here is the PTM7950, and you can see that I've already cut out a chunk, and this went to my GPD WinMax 2 already. I'm going to go ahead and chop off this little layer, and I'm going to go ahead and reuse it as much as I can. But I'm going to go ahead and try to, as best as I can, try to match up and see what I need to remove here. All right, so that's what I got. I'm going to remove this part right here. Okay, and I'm going to use that again. I'm just gonna kind of layer it again because this is pretty forgiving stuff. So I just wanna kind of just plop it here and see where I am, just so that I know that I have covered the entirety of it. Now I went a little bit over the edges and the only reason I did that is because if you try to make it perfect, uh, especially for my type of thing, even though you can like apply tape, you have this type of stuff to try to remove that layer, it's actually fairly difficult. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, apply this, but I'm going to do it outside of the viewfinder because I can't possibly do this on the viewfinder while making sure that there's no dust on there. So I'm going to go ahead and show you the result after that. So I'm doing this. So now you can see that I had a nice layer on the bottom, but I also used that extra strip and I just kind of plopped more on top. 
and that little tiny strip that was just excess, I wouldn't have been able to really use it anywhere else. But more to the point is that because this will turn into a liquid, it'll kind of combine with itself. And as long as we start staging how we're heating up, all of this will there'll be a push out effect that happens on the heatsink and the die itself, where any excess will get pushed out. And what it needs will actually just stay in the middle. So it's very, very forgiving on how it installs on there. You don't need to have that perfect layer like you see I have on the bottom there. You can just, I just put on that extra strip kind of all, you know, uh, wherever I could put it. So I put a little extra strip there, a little extra strip there, and whatever is remaining right there. So it's a little bit sloppy, but again, it's very forgiving stuff. So now I'm going to go ahead and make sure all the dust is off there, and I'm going to put this together. Okay, so this part is also you know, you have to do it right. So I've, I've started screwing in this one, but you don't want to screw in all the way. You want to kind of do it in an X pattern. So we're gonna go one, two, three, and four, but you want to just turn it, screw it in just a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, and then tighten them all just so that we kind of have an even amount of pressure on the plate when we do it. All right, so at this point, we've finished the install of the PTM7950. Now remember, you don't want to screw in right here because that's going to be the screw for the 2230 slot. And we're gonna put everything back together right now. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. I try to do this in another direction which I can see so you can kind of hopefully hear it click in so we're gonna put this part over here okay and then I'm going to get my finger in there and it'll you'll hear a click all right I tried as best as I can to so you guys can hear that it's really simple to put back in so it's right there you can see that this is now not going anywhere. So it's firmly clicked in place. You can hear it click. I was not able to do it while looking through the viewfinder, so I had to do it outside the viewfinder. But with that there, now we can start screwing everything back in. Putting the 2230 back on, it might be wise to actually first put in the, the 2230 in the heatsink itself and just kind of make sure it's firmly mated with that thermal tape. And the holes align, and now we can put it back in. All right, and this is back in, and I put the fan back in, and I try to, like, redo the shroud a bit. You may want to try to get some, like, electrical tape, if you want, just so you can match it with, uh, the, you know, the black tape, so that you can try to baffle this around. So just make sure that all of the air that's being pulled in is being all directed over just these fins themselves, so we're not having any air escape anywhere, uh, because we just want it to be as efficient as possible. So I'm going to try to look for some electrical tape myself, and then I'm going to put it back together by hooking in the rumble motor and then powering it up and then uh, stepping through the phases of like starting at 10 watt uh, burn in, 15 watt, and then 20 watt, and then uh, capturing the results and seeing how much better PTM 7950 is over the stock solution. Okay, so here is the electrical tape that I found. So I'm just going to go ahead and wrap it around there and making sure that all of the air that's coming in is efficiently pushing out through those fins. And then I'm going to go ahead and connect it and close it up and we'll do some testing. Okay, so that was the application part of it. Now let's just take a brief detour into the graphs part of this. Now, there are some people that have talked to me that they're getting different results with the ba on battery as well as plugged in. All of my tests have been plugged in, which should be the hotter version of this. However, it should be noted that if you are just using the default power schema on Windows, that it will actually change how it operates between those two modes and things will change because of that. Using Cypher's utility, we can get around that. That will be in another video that I cover later on. Right now, let's just get into the part where we take a look at the differences very quickly between PTM7950 and the thermal interface solution that was uh, provided by GB themselves. And this is what it looks like over around like an hour and a half. I'm also including in here CPU benchmark results so that we're just specifying CPU burn-in as well as general gaming. So general gaming will be using some CPU and some GPU, whereas CPU will just be lighting up those eight CPU cores and having 20 watt just sent to those. Having said that, both of the results that I have show pretty consistent results. Overall, it is an improvement, not a gigantic improvement. And this could just be because the thermal interface material that GPD sent my way was the best that they could possibly do. So we're not seeing gigantic gains here and we're only seeing a small difference here. And again, shows why I recommend PTM 7950, generally speaking, just because it is so forgiving. And even in this video where I did the application and it's kind of a layered mess that you don't really have to worry as much with the application process because it will self-regulate itself and push out whatever is needed and create a very thin layer as it's heated up because it will turn to a liquid-like, liquid-like-ish state uh, when it gets hot and when it gets cold, it will come into like a, a hardened uh, pad. So it's pretty interesting material and work, works absolutely fantastic. That's it for this particular video. I hope it was informative. As always, guys, thank you for your time. 
and thanks for watching.